All right, so it's day two of the hearing to have Fulton County, Georgia District Attorney Fannie Willis. Uh, it ended an explosive testimony today. First of all, Nathan Wade's former divorce attorney and law partner, Terrence Bradley, they were called back to the stand for impeachment purposes, but ended up getting exposed for, as to why he was no longer a law partner. Meanwhile, Fannie Willis's father, John Clifford Floyd III, explained why his daughter kept cash in their home, and former Governor Roy Barnes explained why he did not want to be the special prosecutor in the case. Um, were you approached um, by uh, the district attorney of Fulton County, uh, Fannie Willis, um, about being a special prosecutor? I was. Uh, I don't do you, I don't recall the exact date, but uh, I know it was sometime uh, in 2021. And uh, she asked me to come down, and uh, I met with her and Nathan. There were several other in the meeting. Uh, she asked me, uh, said they were beginning this investigation, and she asked me if I'd be interested in being special prosecutor, to which I replied that I had mouths to feed at a law office and uh, that I could not, I would not do that. And also, I just had a bad, well, I'll say bad because it happens from time to time, but I just had the FBI to report to making threats against me. And because I was, I thought it was because of the flag, but I asked him and he said, no, it was because I was too close to the Jews, quote unquote. And uh, I told uh, ultimately you, you turned down. Yes, yeah, I told her. I, I said uh, uh, I'm not interested. But it's a black thing, okay? You know, I was trained, and most black folks they hide cash or they keep cash, and uh, I was. No, I train. You always keep some cash because uh, I've been places, and just because of the color of my skin. For example, I took a fellowship at Harvard when my daughter was just a, uh, uh, if I might, Your Honor, if I might, when I was just, uh, she was just, you know, maybe three years old. And I remember going to a restaurant in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I had a American Express credit card and maybe a visa or whatever. And uh, I had a lot of um, what they call traveler's checks. I don't even know if they still have traveler's checks, but traveler's checks. And there was a sign said, you know, with the credit card, for whatever reasons, the man would not take my American Express credit card. So I pulled out my visa card and he wouldn't take my visa card. So then I pulled out my traveler's checks. He said, we don't take checks. Now, this was, these were traveler's checks. This was money. I had a $10 bill. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And uh, he said, uh, uh, the bill for my wife at the time, uh, Fonnie's mother, Fonnie and myself, was like $9.95, and I had a $10 bill. That was all that. And I always remember that. Um, but even before that, I've always kept cash, I, you know, and I've told my daughter, you keep six months worth of cash always. For example, I had three safes in my house. Uh, I put some of my clients stuff there, too, uh, things I didn't want other lawyers to be. I mean, because you're always in a firm and I knew that there were special conditions. So some of my clients, things I would bring home, put them in the safe. But I've always kept safes. And as a matter of fact, I gave my daughter uh, her first cash box and told her, always keep some cash. So joining me to dissect all of this is Monique Presley. Um, you know something, Monique? I look at this father and I say, you know, that really is a dad being a dad. He told his story. He took his time. And another thing is that he really knows the law. What do you make, first of all, about the testimony from Fannie Willis's father? Well, I thought he uh, was the best example of stereotypes being dispelled. I love it when that happens. I love it when it's very obvious that what people were expecting from her daddy, her daddy, her daddy, that she kept talking about yesterday and always keep cash, was not the brilliant, uh, distinguished, elegant, thoughtful, 
experienced legal mind of a man that we met today. So I I was pleased uh, that we got to meet this international trial lawyer who has raised an exceptional daughter. And I understood her a lot better after I heard his testimony today. Yeah, I think that he made some things clear, especially about the cash that he trained his daughter to have in the house. That made a lot more sense when she was talking. He really was clear and very, very pointed and that his daughter was not going to be out there and be left to dry. She was always going to have money. And I think that made a big difference because the question that uh, people are asking is, why does she have in cash? Is there something underhanded going on here? But I was training from her dad. Well, I mean, and it's a black thing. You know, it's a culture thing. I, I tech tweeted or whatever they call tweets now that the name is X, that that others may just need to get a copy of Culture Codes or some <laughs> similar game to uh, help them understand things like grandma and them always had cash under the mattress or some other similar place that uh, women, when they were going traveling, you know, they reached down as tied up on the... On, on the brazier. I mean, these are just things that are known, things that in our culture are done and in other cultures, not just in ours. Uh, and so she wasn't talking things that were foreign to many of us, though those things may have sounded strange. Uh, at the end of his his testimony, though, he said candidly that it was discussed between him and the state's attorney's office and that he was prepped and that he did watch what happened. It would be hard not to watch. He's a person who pays attention to the news. But he was also clear that he wasn't under subpoena and he wasn't a planned witness. So there wasn't any requirement that he knew of that he was supposed to be sequestering himself as some of these who are who were on the witness list for this evidentiary hearing. So I think that the judge decided that that didn't mean that his testimony would be eliminated, that that would go to weight, that would go to credibility, it wouldn't go to admissibility. Uh, but I think that there were other things that he helped on that they really didn't want uh, to be highlighted because they tried to make it look like, oh, she didn't have to leave her home. Maybe the uh, security issues weren't that bad. And, you know, there's a certain sector of our population that in this political climate never wants to admit that those things are as bad as they are. But he went into detail about the fact that after she won her election, uh, their house was swarmed, that they had to have detail around the clock, that she was simply not safe there and no one else was going to be safe as long as she was there, that she had to leave and that she's had to move multiple times and how much he has been concerned for and worried about her safety uh, and all the ways that it has affected their relationship. So for those yes. on, the, on the side of uh, President Trump and the co-defendants, I think it was made clear, uh, one, this is the state of the way she has to live and has had to live, not just since taking on this case, but since winning the election, because that is the way race is in America right now, uh, but especially so after taking on this case. I, I think that Roy Barnes, that he really buttressed his point in that this is a dangerous case, so much so that, I mean, you don't get paid that much for it when you take on this role, but it's also very, very dangerous. Um, Fani's father talked about how he only saw her about 13 times over the past year or two. He could count them, um, you know, and, and, and it really, really distressed him. So I think what it really brought to light was the danger that she has been in for so, so, so many years. And I that convoluted a lot of things in terms of where these locations were. Was, you know, was Wade, Nathan Wade, someone who came to this house or that house? Well, it all depended on so many moving parts. I think at one point, though, I was wondering, you know, we are into the weeds here. And not that I was lost, but it just wasn't information that pertained to the case. But I think that this was the strategy of those who were asking Fani and her father questions just to get people thinking about something other than Trump. Well, listen, Candace, you can appreciate as as just a counselor yourself, um, the, the witnesses had important things to share, but the people who were responsible for pulling out those important things, especially on the side of the defendants, were not doing a skilled job of it. Uh, I they they had the father up there through an entire 
uh, attorneys <laughs> questioning, and it yeah. never mentioned the cash with the, the Miss Merchant. She got up and sat down and never even asked the dad uh, the, about the cash. And even though that was obviously one subject that he could share information on that I would think were I in her position, I would be interested in asking about. But I'm glad you mentioned the testimony of the governor, the former governor, Roy Eugene Barnes. Wasn't he a piece of work? But that, yes, again, was. was important. That highlighted, uh, which I thought was necessary, that, that that special prosecutor, Wade, was not the first choice, uh, that she wasn't earmarking, that, that D.A. Fonnie Willis was not snagging a job uh, for the purpose of giving him a gig to give him money, that if she had had her druthers, she would have picked a former governor who had significant experience in this area doing high profile cases, et cetera. But you know, that dog would not. As they would say that neck of the woods and in my neck of the woods, he was not interested. That's right. Really not interested, not interested in that particular job. Listen, we're going to keep you here. Uh, we're going to talk about this more on the other side of the break, more with Monique Presley on Roland Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. Stay with us. You and Mr. Wade, I think you described your relationship in a lot of details um, earlier about specific circumstances, but you you were business partners in, let's say, up till the time you left in uh, summer 2022, correct? That is correct. You were business partners up until that time? Uh, yes, I said yes, that, that is correct. Okay. And while you didn't socialize together frequently, you considered yourself a friend of Mr. Wade at that time? Yes, we were friends at that time, yes. All right. Uh, you are no longer business partners. That is correct. You are no longer friends. I mean, if he's saying that we're not friends, then I, yeah. I want to know what you think, Mr. Bradley. Do you consider yourself a friend of Mr. Wade? I'll Mr. consider. I'm not sure. It goes to potential bias. Miss Cross. Mm -hmm. Would I consider myself a friend of Mr. Wade? Mm -hmm. I would. Questions, Mr. Bradley, about the circumstances under which you left the firm. Do you recall those questions? I do. All right. And you left the firm. The firm remained the same as far as other employees, Mr. Wade and Mr. Campbell, as the main partners of the firm. You were the one who left, correct? That is correct. And you termed it as a disagreement. Do you recall answering questions as though you left due to a disagreement? Yes? Yes. And that disagreement was that there was an allegation of sexual assault by an employee made against you, correct? That is incorrect. There was not an allegation that you assaulted us, that you sexually assaulted one of the employees in the firm. That is incorrect, but... Yes. Yes. Yes, there was an allegation that you sexually assaulted a member of the firm, correct? Yes, there was an allegation, yes. And as a result of that allegation, you left? I did. And you were no longer business partners with Mr. Wade? That is correct. The firm remained intact, and in fact, the employee involved remained with the firm, correct? I'm not certain of that. Um, they did leave the, the building, of course, um, and I don't know, um, some employees did leave. Mr. Bradley, you in fact paid that employee twenty thousand dollars, correct? That is, in, uh, that is, that is incorrect. As far as what was no. on or about the time that you left the firm, and on or about the time that the allegation of sexual assault was made against you, did you pay the person who had made the allegation of sexual assault any amount of money? There was money left in an escrow that belonged to me. I don't know what that amount was. And did that money that was left in the escrow that belonged to you, was that paid to the employee who said that you signed I never, I never signed any, I never gave any money. I never, I left the money in the escrow account. What happened to that money, um, I can't. 
I, I don't know what happened to it. For what purpose did you leave the money in the escrow account when you left the firm? I left the money in the escrow account. Um, For what purpose, sir? There was no purpose. You just left the money in the escrow account? Yes. If there's no connection to the money you left in the escrow account and the allegations of sexual assault that an employee of your firm made against you, why was it that you brought to my attention? Why did you respond the way you did about money in an escrow account when my question was, did you pay this employee any money? I didn't hand any money. Um, it's, it was money from my escrow account to my knowledge. Um, to your knowledge, where did the money in the escrow account go? To the employee. To that employee. All right, Monique. So that was Nathan Wade's former divorce attorney and law partner, Terrence Bradley. What do you make of his testimony? It took him a little while to get to this whole sexual assault issue, but how do you think all of that actually affected this particular hearing? The hearing, net, net zero. I mean, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I got to be honest with you. That was perplexing to me in many ways. I saw it coming. I have been going back and forth as I've been watching with other lawyers and, and a lawyer who's also doing TV tonight after the first part where we had this former partner, former lawyer of special prosecutor Wade, when we find out he's been sending these text messages uh, back and forth to Miss Merchant, the opposing counsel, that, that he has been discussing personal and professional business of his former partner and former client with this woman and reviewing um, motions and discussing ways that she could get affidavits. I mean, this is what we're hearing. He's not answering because he can't answer because his, his former client Mr. Wade holds the privilege, and so Mr. Wade's lawyer is in there objecting, and so he can't answer one way or the other. And so he's looking squirmish, he's looking skittish, but one of my colleagues said, well, at least now we know why he fought so hard to testify, you know, uh, these text messages. And I'm like, no, we don't know yet. We we don't yeah. know, because the, the answer that he, he didn't want to give was very obvious when one of the people said to him, why did you leave? You left uh -huh. because you were, uh, there were accusations. And he said, no. And he said, and the lawyer said, I'm not saying to you whether you were accusing Wade or Wade was accusing you or who was accusing whom. And he said, we left because of a disagreement and I left because I wanted to go out on my own. Now that was a lie. So now yeah. we've got this, this, this young man, attorney, who has put his, bar license and his liberty in the crosshairs of a judge while he is under oath when the other side is the freaking prosecutors. Huh. I, I yep. don't at all understand how, especially as a lawyer, knowing for himself, even if nobody else knew, even if he didn't know, Bonnie Willis knows about this. Wade knows about this. That means that whole side of the aisle that I'm going in to testify about, they all know about this. These other folks over here, they probably know about it. I don't understand how he didn't have a lawyer for himself as he was testifying today, why there wasn't an evidentiary hearing beforehand in which his lawyer was moving to preclude from evidence this very damaging uh, facts of these allegations, whether true or not true, that they shouldn't have been able to bring it up, not even for the purposes of impeachment, all of this should have gotten ferreted out beforehand because uh -huh. he walked really and talked to himself. Path. Pardon? Yeah, this is really off the, the path that we we're actually originally supposed to be on when we are talking about why he was let go at a law firm that you said was privileged information anyway. How are we no, there? No, I don't I don't know that it was privileged and I don't believe that it was off the beaten path. I think when you sit your behind in a witness chair and you are a black man in America and you have had allegations of sexual misconduct against you, you better believe that these white folks don't find the path. And that is exactly <laughs> what happened. 
So anytime you were in that position, yeah, you try not to get in the chair, but if you are going to get in the chair, you're going to get in the chair with somebody there protecting you. You're going to get in the chair knowing that all of this has been decided and that you either will or will not have to testify about it. And if it was privilege, if that was the story he was going with, then he should have stuck to that damn story. I'm sorry I'm cussing, but I just... I was lost. <laughs> no, I understand. You know? Listen, listen. Uh, a lot, a lot of people have been hot uh, over this, uh, especially those who actually sat down during this hearing. I want to bring in the panel, Michael Impotet, uh, host of the African History Network show. He comes to us from Detroit, Michigan. Matt Manning, he's a civil rights attorney out of Corpus Christi, Texas, and Kelly Bathia. She is a communication strategist out of Washington, D.C. Thank you, all of you, for being here. Listen, there are so many things to be discussed. I just want to open up the floor first while we have Monique to talk about what you thought, Michael, about today's hearings and questions that you might have for Monique. All right. Uh, great to see everybody today. Uh, I'm the only non-attorney on here. I guess I got my law degree from Trump University. But uh, <laughs> so I, so I, I watched uh, coverage of the hearing on Thursday and watched some of the coverage today. I've read numerous articles with this and I also read the the original indictment out of Fulton County, Georgia, as well. And I still haven't heard uh, any evidence that would. Um, uh, that that would the charges against Michael Roman, the charges against the co-defendants, the 161 overt acts that Fonnie Willis lays out in the indictment. I haven't heard any evidence that undermines any of that. Okay, and you know this is to me this sounds like a fishing expedition. Okay, they're just trying to find something that will stick. Uh, but you know her father uh, today was excellent. Uh, I watched some of the. Uh, cover some of the testimony from uh, Terrence Bradley as well. So we'll see how this turns out. But um, she surprised, Fonnie Willis surprised uh, uh, the attorney for Michael Roman on Thursday when she unexpectedly testified. And I think she blew everybody away with their testimony mm. also. So um, and they, they, this is what happens when you mess with a black woman. I'm just, I'm just gonna put this out here. This is what happens when you mess with a black woman. It blows up in your face like Wild E. Coyote. So we'll see you have, how this you turns have a question out. from Monique? Um, Monique, uh, so based upon, I, I saw, uh, I think you were on yesterday as well on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Um, what are your feelings about the end result so far, what we've seen over the two days, the end result, what, uh, Judge McAfee has to determine, would any of this disqualify, uh, Fonnie Willis as well as, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Wade? So I'll, I'll answer you two ways. Uh, all things being fair and the judge doing the job that he should do in this case, then it's clear that the burden has not been met. There has yes. to be a determination that based on whatever the relationship was and whenever the relationship occurred, that the, the um, prejudice to the other side is such that they could not get a fair trial. That's what the conflict would have to result in. And mm -hmm. there hasn't even been enough evidence to show that there is a conflict. So there's much less to show that right. there would be a conflict such that there would not be a fair trial. I think this judge has done a good job of calling balls and strikes for the most part. He has not yeah. necessarily done the, the job I would have preferred in terms of keeping things out that um, are not solid evidence and not based in fact. He lets witnesses guess and assume and opine. But, and maybe that's because it's an evidentiary hearing and there's no jury there. Uh, and right. He holds the reins tighter when there is a jury present. But my belief is that that would be the right thing to do. And my hope is that this conservative judge does the right thing. Right. All right, Matt, okay. question for Monique. Well, first, I want y'all to know that I texted the producer and say, y'all got to let me know when Candace and Monique are going to be on. I would have made different <laughs> points today. All my heroes on. But at any rate, uh, my question is, it's kind of along the lines of that, Monique. I mean, were there any limiting instructions or anything on this? Because it, and usually when judges are in this circumstance, they want things to be as compact as possible, and they don't want it to get unwieldy in terms of disparaging remarks that are really extraneous to the central question. So did the judge issue any limiting instructions or anything uh, about the evidence? Because it seems to me we're pretty far afield of the question of the conflict, which is what you normally see in these disqualification proceedings. 
he hasn't issued any limiting instructions. The one thing I think he did that that was helpful is he made ask and answered um, apply to all of the defendants. So if one defendant's counsel got up and asked a question and it got answered, everybody else didn't get their shot at the same question, even though they tried, he would say that was already answered during previous examination with a previous witness. But frankly, Matt, um, and you're one of my heroes too, I don't know that today really ended up that far afield. Impeachment is what it is. You open right. your mouth and say something, you're going to end up getting somebody saying something back to you if you're lying, if you're not on there being credible, uh, if, you, if you're hedging. And I and like I said, that leads me back to my principal concern, not just as a career defense attorney who hated seeing that today, even though Bruss snitched on his friends and his clients and none of us who are on this panel are that type of lawyer. Uh, I think that's disgusting in and of itself, no matter how mad you get or what happened to you. Uh, there's a reason we are secret keepers and that that privilege is supposed to be held in violet. It is obvious he did not do that. The text messages show he did not do that. And I think that that is shameful. But even in that circumstance, I hated seeing all of these allegations, which did not result in a criminal case, end up being plastered all across the world. This has negatively infected his life um, for, for a good long time. And as I said, now the judge ended it saying he's going to bring him in camera and figure out if he knows what privilege is at all. Mm. So um, this 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 did not go well. And that is, to me, a cautionary tale. Black man in America, don't jaywalk. And if you do jaywalk, right after you jaywalk, call your lawyer, just in case. Yeah. Mm. And I think procedurally, this just isn't the case that you, so, you show a law school class to say, this is how it's done. There was a, there was a lot um, of shortcomings, I think, in terms of some of the attorneys who call themselves doing their job. Kelly, what do you have for uh, Monique? So what, and I say this with the thickest of sarcasm, my favorite <laughs> class in law school was professional responsibility. Uh, <laughs> and um, y'all got the joke, but it was a bad joke, my bad. Anyway, how much of this could have been avoided had Bonnie Willis just disclosed the dynamic between her and Nathan mm. Wade? Because and I, mean, I preface this by saying, you know, it, like it's a very simple answer. I do know that, but I want to preface this by saying all of this is because she had relations with the lead prosecutor when either A, she could have just recused herself, let somebody else on her staff take over this case, or disclose that she once upon a time or at the time had relations with this man. And it is not going to affect because of A, B, and C. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like all of this could have been resolved or not have happened at all had she not had so much hubris and ego regarding this matter. Mm. Right. I mean, Kelly, I, I, I will correct you because I do believe you're wrong. Um, I think it's unfortunate that we, as the women in the power seat, um, have to take these kinds of hits for doing things that are not outside of our professional responsibility obligations, are not outside of our abilities as bosses who can hire and fire, are not outside of whatever it is we are required to do under the law. She meets all of those elements. Would it have been uh, easier, perhaps, to, to move through some of these things if she had disclosed it? Maybe, but it doesn't mean we wouldn't have ended up here because they would have found another way for us to end up here. Because the reason why we're here is because this black woman is in charge of this case and this country is filled with racists and the leaders of that racist sect of our country are being represented by the attorneys on the other side. If there was going to be anything, this isn't the only thing they've tried. This isn't the first, the last, the middle of them trying to disqualify her. This is just the best reason they came up with so far. 
And, and it's not her obligation to live her life such that a racist can't be a racist. It's her obligation to do her job to the best of her abilities. And I try my best not to second guess what that looks like. Uh, I think that people are people. I think that people live in human skin, which is what I said last night. That means we make mistakes. That means we differ in the judgment calls that we would make at any given period of time. That means we have feelings, we have emotions. We have all of those things, uh, and it means that we get to be humans and still do our jobs. Thankfully, the law protects us such that we get to do that. So if she didn't do anything that violated the professional canons of ethics and she didn't do anything that violated the law, then I'm not going to put the blame at her feet for this. I don't think it was her hubris, as you say, that landed us in this position. I think if it was not this, it would be something else. And I think that after we get out of this, it will be something else because that is the stakes of the, the job that she is in right now and the people that she's opposing. I took what her father said uh, to heart and I have, I've been praying for D.A. Willis, uh, for for County Attorney Kim Fox, for all of the, the, the people, Monique Willie, the people who have these very hard jobs and are under constant attack. Letitia James, God help her, especially yeah. after today and that huge win today. I know y'all probably talk about it later in the show and I'll be gone, but I just want to say, <laughs> come on, Bisons, rise up. I see y'all everywhere. Mm especially the women, just saying. But <laughs> I took what her father oh, yeah. said to heart. She is in danger every day. Uh, her life, that of her family, is in danger every day. So though I am analyst and, and I can observe, what I try not to be is a critic of the human spirit because I, we all be messing up sometimes. <laughs> well, Keisha, I, I will say this. I'm going to piggyback off of what Kelly said. And that is, yes, she could have made the decision to say, I have a conflict of interest. And because she knew the stakes as a black woman, which she has spoken about so illustratively, then she could she have made a better decision? And why was not that a little more obvious to her? Because she was in such a high position where she knew that people were magnifying her more than the next person. I do see Kelly's point. Right, but I think they're about to find she did not have a conflict of interest. So she she shouldn't say she has a conflict when she doesn't, is my point. That's the, that's the point that I'm making. I, I, I believe that in the state of the law in Georgia um, is that if her husband was the best person for the job, he could have gotten the job. I believe that the state of the law in Georgia uh, allows for people who work in the same government in, in varying different um, positions of authority can be in relationships and it not be a violation. So it's not the same as what the federal government standards are. And sometimes that's what people look at. But I don't think that she had those limitations. I think that there has to be a question of fairness to the defendants and their ability to get a fair trial and that that has not been met. So I think we're bound by the canons of crazy ass Georgia law. Uh, but right now, the, the person who knows the law better than all of us on this panel, I dare say, is DA um, Fani Taifa Willis. All right, we're going to take a little break. And on the other side of it, I wanted to talk about whether or not, and you touched upon it a little bit, but let's say that she is removed. What are the next steps? Because there are certainly a number of people who just do not want to touch this case at all. Stay with us. Monique Presley is going to stay with us. Also, you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. And we'll be back after a break. All right, I want to open this back up to the panel, but I want to start with you, Matt. As a practicing attorney, what were your thoughts about what you saw today? And what have your thoughts been so far? And Monique, everybody, we can jump in on this conversation. I know we all have a lot to say because there's so much to cover. But Matt, let me start with you. So I didn't get to watch much, much of the testimony beyond what you played here in a little bit before that. But I've actually been the, the first assistant of a DA's office where they were trying to remove the DA for different reasons. But um, I'll say that this is a climate now where they are attacking DAs of all colors, especially progressive DAs, when they don't like that they're doing their job, that they're you know statutorily sworn and given authority to do. So I say that to say a lot of this is, is subterfuge insofar as, you know, they're going to do whatever they can to attack Fonnie Willis. I do think that there is a credible question 
about um, whether there is a conflict. However, the question about whether there being there uh, is a conflict is not tantamount to there actually being a conflict. And I think a lot of Monique's points are, are valid um, here. And I think, you know, especially with Mr. Trump and this being related to Trump, it doesn't surprise me that they're going to try to pull out all the stops to attack uh, Fonnie Willis. But I will say that, you know, this is also a, a thing I've seen other attorneys, meaning the DA, handle differently, where there are some people where there's even the remote appearance of impropriety. They completely step away and step down. But I think in this case, they couldn't really do that because the gravity of this case is just so much greater than your normal case. And she spent so much time assembling a team and putting together a, an indictment and all of that, that it would be a, a waste and really a violation of the public trust to step away if you know there's not a bona fide conflict. So based on what I've seen so far, I don't know that they've met the burden, even if people feel like it may be a best practice in this situation for her to step away. Monique, what are your thoughts about, let's say she is removed, the idea that you won't be able to find somebody for a long time to even take this case? We heard from the former governor who said this wasn't in his wheelhouse. I would imagine that other people might have a problem with it and that if, if she is removed, it will be tough to move this along. Is that something you would agree with? I don't know if it's going to be tough or not. I think that's where the politics is probably going to come into play. Um, in, in 2022, in Georgia, I want to just read what this executive body is called. When a district attorney is disqualified, they decided that the case is referred to an executive director of the Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia. And that executive director is tasked with finding a replacement. So the first effect that it would have if there was a disqualification qualification is the case is going to come to a screeching halt because D.A. Willis and everyone who works under her would not be able to work on this case. So where this case is concerned, they've got to find a special prosecutor and it's got to be somebody who's uniquely qualified to be able to handle this case. So you're looking at this type of expertise and RICO and criminal defense and multiple defendants being tried at the same time, all the things. Uh, and so other, other district attorneys, um, other counties perhaps could be appointed. I think that they said that uh, another D.A. can't refuse it, but maybe you don't want another DA. Maybe you want some high profile, somebody to be willing to take on the case that has the office and the structure to be able to grab it. Or maybe if you're a conservative GOP appointed executive director, you want somebody who's going to scuttle the case and look at the charges and decide that certain defendants no longer have to go forward. All of those things would be up for grabs. Michael and Kelly, uh, jump in here. Do you think, Michael, that Trump's looked at these two hearings, which I'm sure he did if he had time between his other cases, and said to himself, this is a good day for me when it comes to this particular um, uh, Fonnie Willis situation? Um, I don't think this was a—I don't think he would look, especially on uh, Thursday, he would look at that and say, this was a good day for me. But I'm telling you, today, um, he's reeling and he's infuriated, and uh, Letitia James just grabbed him by the wallet for the tune of $355 million. So I'm telling you right true. now, he's pissed off. He's pissed off to the highest of pissivity. But my, my question for um, Attorney uh, Monique uh, Presley is, so the premise— of the uh, convoluted argument that uh, Michael Roman's attorneys are making is that Fonnie Willis hired Nathan Wade to uh, run the, to oversee the prosecution of Trump and the 18 co-defendants. And she benefited uh, by trips that he took her on and dinners he took her on. And this was an investigation that lasted approximately two years. But she then paid back, paid them back in cash for the trips and the dinners. Am I getting this correct? Yes. OK. Yeah, it didn't make any sense to me either, but OK. All right. <laughs> Yes. I, I mean, and it's, it's, I a, sad, it's a sad state of affairs. So I'm, I'm just making sure I got the facts straight. But yeah. yeah, it didn't make any sense to me when I heard it the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time. But okay, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, I mean, and they're, they're saying that she has a, a, a money benefit uh, in the hiring, and the best that they can come up with is that she benefited because of a yeah. cruise with his mama and an Aruba trip and going to Tennessee right. and so they California. So they invested for some... two years. To go on a couple of trips, two or three trips, and then be taken out to dinner a few times. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, this yeah. is I, that's this is when you know part. they're desperate. 
This is what I know. That's the interesting part that I find out that I find uh, about about Special Prosecutor Wade and about DA Bonnie Willis. You know, they keep saying, "Why did nobody know? Why was it so private?" And I'm kind of like, "Well, I mean, look at what they're dealing with. It's kind of obvious why they lead Mm -hmm. why they lead private lives because right. This is this is what is possible." Yeah, death threats she was already getting, so you don't want people know to know who you're involved with because they become a, can be become a target as well. Yes. And so many people that I spoke to today said, well, I certainly learned a lot about a potential Hollywood deal her father had and her dating philosophy and what they think about money, how she grew up a little <laughs> bit, relationship with her father. We learned a lot, but getting to the core of what they were actually asking questions about, not a lot of meat on that bone there. Kelly, jump in. Do you have a question for Monique? No question at the moment, um, but I will say that the reason why they kept it so private, aside from the obvious, her being high profile and him now being high profile as lead prosecutor, is the fact that, technically speaking, he was still a married man. This was infidelity that they were hiding. So I'm not trying to, you know, disparage another Black woman, certainly not trying to make it look you know, worse than it is. But the fact of the matter remains is that a large reason why this was secret isn't because of protection of of each other's jobs, but protection of each other's marital status. You know, and, and I think that is a large... Like, that, that is the, the propaganda of this all. Like, this is what is painting her in a bad light, not just the fact that she had relations with this man, but the fact that he was a married man and she still Mm -hmm. had relations with him. And granted, there's a lot of murky water when it comes to people who are on the precipice of divorce. I am not by any means judging her for that. Um, I know plenty of people who, who, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is not a, a off case here. Like, there, there's gray everywhere here. But the fact of the matter, this is why I, was so adamant about her needing to disclose this. and But also, I see why she did not, because this was a messy situation taking out the Trump case. This was a messy situation for her to be in. She decided, you know, on, on a humane level, romantic level, whatever, to engage in this behavior, and this is what it's costing her. That's why I'm so disappointed in her. Yeah, yes. Um, Monique, I want you to wrap up. What are your final thoughts about where we're going uh, with this hearing and what you think the probability will be uh, of this hearing in terms of the outcome? Well, well, like I said um, a little earlier, I believe that on the facts and the law, the judge uh, should do the right thing because the evidence has not been presented in the case by the co-defendants for them to come anywhere close to reaching their burden in order to be able to disqualify the sitting district attorney. Uh, And my other closing remark, like last night, I'm going to say again, it's Black History Month. um, Hmm. And and this is the first Black woman to to have that position uh, in in Fulton County, Georgia. And um, I believe strongly that nobody really knows uh, what goes on when somebody's marriage ends. Um, there had been a divorce filing in, in this particular case. And as as Wade said, and she said, they weren't hiding. They went on trips. They went some, uh, on a cruise with his own mama. Um, but I, I stand for Black women having the right to lead private lives and whether the reason is there are constant death threats and any partner that they have could end up being front page news or it's because the partner that they've chosen is in the final stages of ending a marriage that had been technically ended years before but is now legally at the edges of ending and the divorce is contentious. So they need to be private because of that. Uh, Whatever the reason is, I think that that is something that I pray uh, that all women who are in power would have an opportunity to have the privacy of their decisions while still being public servants and leading very public lives. I, I personally 
have been through it too many times in my own public facing cases uh, with pictures of my children with barely blurred images of their faces um, put in, in newspapers and rag magazines uh, being personally pursued, people showing up at, at my home, death threats, all of the things. Uh, and, and I cannot say more strongly uh, how much I support the right of privacy, even in public facing individuals for the manner in which they conduct their own personal lives and the real shame of what yeah. these co-defendants are being allowed to do is that it dr has it drags the good names of so many people who are doing work that we all need them to do, critically important work. The real shame is that they are being given an opportunity to do that. So I pray for the best for all of the parties um, on our side of the aisle who are involved in this proceeding. All right, Monique Presley, a lot of personal insight. We thank you for sharing that with us. As always, good to see you and have your legal you. analysis. All right, and I'm Bye. sure that we're going to have you back because uh, this continues. All right, when we come back after a break, we will be talking about that judgment that Trump is said that he will have to pay. Uh, stay with us on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Today we prove that no one is above the law, no matter how rich powerful or politically connected you are, everyone must play by the same rules. We have a responsibility to protect the integrity of the marketplace. And for years, Donald Trump engaged in deceptive business practices and tremendous fraud. Donald Trump falsely, knowingly, inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself, his family, and to cheat the system. Donald Trump may have authored The Art of the Deal, but he perfected The Art of the Steal. This long-running fraud was intentional, egregious, illegal, and he did it all of this, he did all of this with the help of the other defendants, his two adult sons and senior executives at the Trump Organization. And so, after 11 weeks of trial, we showed the staggering extent of his fraud and exactly how Donald Trump and the other defendants deceived banks, insurance companies, and other financial institutions for their own personal gain. We proved just how much Donald Trump, his family, and his company unjustly benefited from his fraud. Today, the court once again ruled in our favor and in favor of every hardworking American who plays by the rules. Donald Trump and the other defendants were ordered to pay $463.9 million. That represents $363.9 million in disgorgement, plus $100 million in interest, which will continue to increase every single day until it is paid. Donald Trump, the former chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, and the former controller of the Trump Organization, Jeffrey McConney, are each banned from serving as an officer or director of any New York company for three years. Mr. Weisselberg and Mr. McConney are also banned for life from serving in a financial management role in any New York company. Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump are banned from serving as an officer or director of any New York company for two years. And Donald Trump and his companies are banned from applying for loans from any New York bank or financial institution for three years. A new independent director of compliance will be created at the Trump Organization to ensure the company establishes internal protocols and meets financial reporting obligations. And the current independent external monitor will continue to oversee the company's financial dealings and ensure this fraud cannot continue. I want to be clear. White collar financial fraud is not a victimless crime. When the powerful break the law and take more than their fair share, there are fewer resources available for working people, small businesses and families. And everyday Americans cannot lie to a bank, 
about how much money they have in order to get a mortgage to buy a home or a loan to keep their business afloat or to send their child to college. And if they did, our government would throw the book at them. I want to thank the entire incredible and hardworking team in my office that tried this case. Because the scale and the scope of Donald Trump's fraud is staggering. And so too is his ego and his belief that the rules do not apply to him. Today, we are holding Donald Trump accountable. We are holding him accountable for lying, cheating, and a lack of contrition, and for flouting the rules that all of us must play by. Because there cannot be different rules for different people in this country, and former presidents are no exception. This decision is a massive victory for every American who believes in that simple but fundamental pillar of our democracy, that the rule of law applies to all of us equally, fairly, and justly. All right, some powerful words from Attorney General Letitia James, who talked about uh, the former president, Donald Trump, practicing not the art of the deal, but the art of the steal. Not only will he, he be penalized, but his sons are penalized, each paying $4 million apiece. Adam uh, 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 Weisenberg, too, he is going to be fined $1 million. So we have a lot of moving parts here, but she was firm and she was deliberate and she was intent in making sure that people knew that Donald Trump cannot defraud anyone, especially not in New York. Matt, what do you think about, first of all, this particular amount of money that Trump uh, is supposed to be paying? We know he's going to appeal it, but that is the charge and that was the sum today. Well, I think it's a staggering amount of money. But one of the things, if you'll indulge me, that I really wanted to break down for the viewers is something I was confused about. And I actually talked to my law partner before I came on the show. And I said, you know, Trump's team is crazy. Why did they go to have a trial in front of just the judge, a bench trial rather than a jury? And the reason I asked that is because usually you want to have more people who are looking at the facts and have the possibility of having them not reach the threshold to render liability or in a criminal case, unanimity. But here's the brilliance about all of this that I didn't even realize until today, until I read the judge's order. Letitia James and her team are brilliant because what they brought is a case not seeking monetary damages. They brought a case seeking uh, equitable relief, so uh, disgorgement. And what that means mm. is that Mr. Trump and his, his uh, cadre of businesses have to pay back ill-gotten gains, not necessarily um, paying on a monetary judgment. The reason that's brilliant is in New York, I didn't know this, but the law that they prosecuted this case under um, from a civil standpoint um, does not allow for jury trials. Because it's equitable relief, they get to present that in a trial to just the judge. What the judge, I think, did here that was absolutely brilliant is he issued a 92-page opinion where he did his findings of fact and conclusions of law. And what those are is where a judge says, these are the facts that I found, and here's what that means legally. He issued that for every witness. So he literally said, here's what I got from this witness. Here's what this proved here. Here's what you know this proved there. And the reason all of that is important in the overall scope is this will undoubtedly be appealed. But when it's appealed at the next level, the judges at the next level will look to see whether he abused his discretion. And they will basically, generally the way it works, is they give him deference for the decisions that he made based on his findings of fact and conclusions of law. So, you know, as much as we talk about the brilliance of these two black women, Fonnie Willis and, and Tish James, this is brilliant. The legal strategy here is genius to me because the way they brought it uh, took away his ability to have a jury trial. It goes just in front of a judge. And then here, once the judge, if he makes the decision that he's liable, that judge gets to determine, based on um, a, another judge being involved as kind of an independent um, monitor, what he thinks the, the disgorgement amount is. So this amount is what the Trump companies and the individual defendants have to pay back for the ill-gotten gains with the fraud. Um, and I think the legal strategy just all around was, was brilliant in how they approached this. And I think it is a watershed moment and one that shows that you know, if the right person is in office and they investigate it the right way and they conceptualize the case the right way, 
there's really a chance to hold somebody accountable where you can prove to a finder of fact that, in fact, there has been a breaking of the law, as they did here. And you make a very uh, valid point in that, on appeal, they're not arg arguing the facts of the case. But when you look at the facts themselves, they're going to see it really, you're looking at the numbers. You're looking at the actual numbers, and that's what this translates to, and that's how they actually got these particular numbers that can't be refuted based upon their own testimony, is what you're saying. Exactly. And I think the judge protected that against the appeal. I mean, that's not to say that the appellate court could not disagree with his findings of fact and conclusions of law. But, you know, it's going to be very hard to to paint this as erroneous, as his decision as not being based in, you know, his independent qualification of the facts and evaluation of the facts, especially because he delineated all of that in a nearly 100-page order. So I, I think on both sides, this is going to be very strong. It doesn't mean there won't be some part of it that may come back down on appeal but uh, this was, was brilliant in terms of the strategy and how it was argued, and even the judge in terms of how he rendered his order. Kelly, what also came out of this case is that there's going to be a monitor that will continue monitoring. This is someone who already has been monitoring, someone who Trump has said messed up a number of business deals by the tune of millions. What are your thoughts, Kelly, uh, about this monitor and what that really means and translates into when we talk about Trump and the way that well, he really can't do a lot of business, but just in terms of the business itself, in terms of the Trump organization and how it can even exist. It feels like this might be the first time in Trump's life, certainly his business life, where he's basically being forced to be held accountable for his actions. Um, the A large reason as to why um, this case even came to be is because he was able to lie. He was able to inflate and conflate and manipulate the numbers so that he looks like he has more money than he has or he's more good for the money that he's trying to borrow than he is. And with with this judgment, he not only is he not able to do that anymore, there are now powers that be that are responsible for making sure that he's not even able to do that anymore. So for me, this is refreshing. And I hope that, you know, this is a, a kind of a cornerstone case for other millionaires and billionaires and businessmen who are um, doing white collar crimes like this to be put on notice that at least in New York, you're not going to get away with it because, like she mm. said, white crimes are real crimes, too, and they are not victimless. They affect, uh, arguably, even more people than, say, blue-collar crime or uh, crimes that we see on TV that have been <laughs> televised and, frankly, glorified. And, Michael, we're not just looking at Trump. We're looking at Alan Weissenberg, and then we are looking at his sons. Uh, they uh, are penalized in the amount of $4 million a piece. They can't right. run the firm. What do you think this for means, essentially, for... That's right, for two years. What do you think this essentially means for the Trump organization and whether or not it can really thrive? Well, the Trump organization is in, in deep, deep trouble. And uh, if we just go back to 2015, 2016, when Trump was running, I told people when I was on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF um, as a radio show host, I told them week after week, uh, the only people that think Donald Trump is a, a successful businessman are people who don't understand business and poor people. Because people who understand business knew he was a fraud. We knew he was a fraud back in 2015, 2016. We knew he was a fraud back in when The Apprentice was on, this, this TV game show, OK? He's never been a successful businessman. And when we look at what broke this, what really led us to this point today. Now, also, keep in mind, he was held accountable uh, in the uh, Trump University uh, civil lawsuit. We had to pay $24 million, OK? And that was right before he uh, became, well, right when he won the presidency through the Electoral College, he uh, agreed to pay that. He said he was going to fight it, but, but he agreed to pay that. So we saw that accountability uh, uh, when he right before he was president, okay, this is an avalanche of it. But what led us to this was the testimony in 2019 before the House Oversight Committee by Michael Cohen, his former attorney for 10 years. This was right before Michael Cohen went to prison, and Michael Cohen knew where all the the bodies were buried, and he brought evidence. 
He brought checks. He brought evidence to prove what he was talking about. And what he testified to was that when Donald Trump applies for loans, he inflates the value of his properties just out of thin air. But then when he go, when it's time to pay taxes uh, on those properties, he deflates the, uh, the, the, uh, the value of those properties, OK? So if we just look at uh, one property here, Seven Springs uh, was appraised at $30 million, but Trump's value was $261 million to $291 million. When we look at Mar-a-Lago, Mar-a-Lago was appraised at $18 million to $27.6 million. Donald Trump said the value was $426 million mm. to $612 million, okay? So he belongs in prison, all right? I'm telling you, this is straight-up fraud, okay? And, and in business school, we have to take a class called business ethics, okay? You can't... you. This is required to graduate, at least when I was in business school 30 years ago. You take business ethics. This is criminal, okay? Now, now this was a civil trial, but this is criminal. So there's more to come. And Alvin Bragg, that trial starts uh, March 25th, okay? That's the, right. The uh, trial in Manhattan, that starts March 25th. What brought us to all this was Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, because Michael Cohen was mm. the one who orchestrated the payoff of Stormy Daniels, $130,000, and I was the one who broke the story right here in Detroit on 19 AM WFDF when the story first came out about Stormy Daniels, okay? It was a story I saw on rawstory.com, and I was on the air with uh, Cliff Russell, who's passed away since then. We were on commercial break. It comes across my news feed. I say, Cliff, take a look at this. We come back from the break. We talk about this. I said, this sounds like campaign, this sounds like uh, campaign finance uh, law violation. Sure enough, that's what it looks like it is. So we'll see how this turns out. This is not going to be a hot boy summer for Donald Trump. I'm telling you right now, this is going to be the worst <laughs> summer of his life. You know, Matt, you talked about strategy earlier. Now, some people might say, yeah, there's a lot of snow here, but not the full avalanche. I mean, his sons can get back in the game in a couple of years. Donald Trump, he can't do business in New York for a certain period of time, but it doesn't preclude him from getting loans from other states. What do you say about the fact that this was not just a full kibosh on the Trump organization and Trump not being able to do anything anywhere in perpetuity? Well, that's an interesting question, and I think part of it is, you know, businesses very often don't even incorporate in the states where they do business. They might incorporate in Delaware. So, you know, he's got a team of lawyers that will surely figure out a way for him to be involved in the Trump organization with its doing business. But to pivot a little bit, what I think is very interesting about this, and I've been thinking about with his future criminal um, cases, particularly the case that D.A. Bragg will be prosecuting, there's a principle in the rules of evidence in pretty much every state and in the federal rules that says extraneous evidence or evidence outside of the case you're on trial for can sometimes come in to show motive or opportunity or intent or other things like that, right? And I think here, yes. this, could be, this could be a watershed moment in that trial, because the premise of D.A. Bragg's trial is the idea that he uh, falsified some records, right, which would be another way of saying fraud. So it stands to reason that the prosecutors there are very happy about this ruling today, because at least if I were a prosecutor, I would argue this is this shows um, M.O. This shows the modus operandi, right? Like what they do is engage in fraud. He's now been found to be liable um, of this fraud in a civil trial. And I think with the, the appropriate limiting instructions, it might come in in a way that doesn't take away his constitutional rights on the criminal end. So I'm really interested in seeing what interplay this has with criminal cases, particularly those where he's accused of some kind of fraud or what we call moral turpitude, which is dishonesty yes. in the law. Um, I think there's a very good chance that Jack Smith and also D.A. Bragg and the other prosecutors are, are very excited about this ruling and trying to find a way to include it to buttress their own criminal cases against Mr. Trump. Agreed. I was thinking that, in fact, Kelly, let me pull you in here. A good day for Alvin Bragg, too, and someone who is preparing for March 25th to look at a way to connect these dots and really allow people to see a full picture. I think that this is something that is working in Bragg's favor. I mean, for sure. I think that as far as these cases are concerned, I think us us lawyers, us politi nerds, everybody, we're really excited about it, but the American people really just want a president that's not Donald Trump. I think that's <laughs> really what we're getting at here. I just want, at least that's that's what's on my heart to share today. I I want this to be kind of wrapped up or at the very least going so that by the time the election is like really underway, like we're, we're seeing the ads left and right, past primaries, all these things, that it's going to look like crap 
absolute mm. crap if this man is even close to winning the election. We, there needs to be something like in the atmosphere that is is just like two plus two equals four. Trump should not be president. He cannot be president. Anything but him. That That's where I'm at with it. Alvin Brack, God bless you. You know, take this, run with it. But anything <laughs> except this man in the Oval Office for four more years. And Kelly, I want to stay with you for a moment. Do you think that the sting of the Stormy Daniels fraud case, and then it also goes into uh, uh, tax fraud um, because of the way that she was paid, do you think that the sting of that is still um, as hurtful? We have been talking about that case for years. Uh, and it just seems to me when I speak to people that they don't really think, especially in comparison to some of these other things, that it's actually that big of a deal anymore. And I think that's the issue because let's just think about what has happened between 2016 and 2020, before Biden was in office. So much was happening as far as corruption and improprieties and like, I'm saying the word wrong, but just wrong things <laughs> were <laughs> got you. In, in this administration such that it was just one thing after another, after another, both on his personal end and on the political end. And it was so overwhelming that for something big to happen, such as Stormy Daniels, it was like a mustard seed in this mountain of of pine needles that was that was happening with this administration. As far as 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 morals and and things that presidents should aspire to be or should be for us to aspire to, the bar has been set below Satan's sphincter as far as what <laughs> is you know standard anymore. Right. Right? So, no, absolutely. Shouldn't the Stormy Daniels think? I'm sorry. I said a lot has changed. Yeah, a lot has changed. Should the Stormy Daniels thing be a big deal? Yes. In a in a world prior to 2016, this would have been beyond the Monica Lewinsky scandal, right? But yes, frankly, we elected a president who already said he's going to grab him by the pussy. Right. Mm. And I and I don't mean to sound vulgar, but that's what he said. And that's if that truth. wasn't enough to not have him in office, anything else, frankly, is up for grabs and, and good to go, as evidence as what we are seeing now in 2024 regarding this man, between the lawsuits and the scandals and the corruptions and the secret partnerships and all of these things. Like I said, the bar is beneath hell when it comes to what is acceptable anymore. Um, Stormy Daniels should not be acceptable, but unfortunately, in the grand scheme of things, it is. Yeah. You know, I'm going to well, piggyback off of what Matt said as before we go to break, and that is there's one thing that you really cannot refute, though, and that is the numbers, the numbers that he inflated in terms of the cost and the values of all of his properties and the numbers sure. and the money that was gained on his end Two plus two was always four. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about Trump on the other side of this because he is allegedly talking about abortion. So stay with us. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered, and we'll be back after a short break. Uh, that is it for us. Uh, Michael, you got a uh, class coming up real quick? Yeah, Saturday, February 10th, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a new 10-week online history course. Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade, with the, what they didn't teach you in school. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Register right now. You've never seen anything like this. It's going to totally blow you away. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Folks, that's it for us. Uh, Michael, Kelly, Matt, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, and we also have the information right here in the thread of the broadcast. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, this is a uh, new 10-week uh, online history course that I teach. We're going to do an introduction today as soon as I finish here. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay, and uh, this is over 200 slides that I put together. Uh, we have uh, 80 to 100 articles that we reference. Uh, we have uh, 
excerpts of interviews that I've done with uh, many of our scholars over the years also that hits on different aspects uh, of this history. OK, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. OK, and just at our website, just click your register here in the class. I'll go over the uh, lesson plan because I have a lesson plan laid out for all 10 classes and uh, we'll send you the lesson plan in the, uh, so you can download it also. I'm trying to get the link straight on the website so you can actually look at the lesson plan there. But this is my life's work. Uh, I started teaching this class in 2007. It's taken seven years to get the class, really develop it to where it is today. 80 to 100 articles, 15 books that we reference. Uh, you don't have to buy any, any of these books to follow follow along in class. Classes on sale, eighty dollars, regular one hundred thirty dollars, and we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so even after the course is over, if you can go back and watch the entire course, okay, so you don't lose access to it. I don't want to. I don't want um, you know to do that. I want you to be able to two three years from now be able to still access this class. All right. Also, if you like this type of information, you can uh, support the African History Network dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So uh, go to our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Scroll down and we have the information here for the um, Cash App PayPal. And when you click on that, this is our official Cash App account dollar sign the AHN show. S-H-O-W, when you go to it, it says, Michael, these other ones are fake African History Network cash app accounts. I'm still trying to get shut down because people have been stealing money from us. OK, uh, these are not uh, ours. They're, they're using our logo, all that stuff. I put the link here. You click on the link and it has our QR code here as well. OK. All right. So, look, I have to get out of here. Uh, we have the link for the class here in the thread of the broadcast. Also, uh, register for the uh full class that helps us keep doing the research stay on the air keep broadcasting if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization uh please uh email me through the website or email me at uh ahn show at the african history network.com ahn show at the african history network.com uh, and uh we can set that up either in person or virtually uh, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization Listen to the African History Network show Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on our social media platforms. Visit our website for more information about that and watch me on Fridays on Roland Martin Unfiltered as well on the Black Star Network on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Roland Martin, Facebook, YouTube, download the Black Star uh, Network app. OK, remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win Wakanda forever.